This is FRM Part 1, Book 2, Quantitative Analysis, Chapter 14, Volatility. I always think of volatility in one of two ways. I think of standard deviation of stock returns and bond returns, which I teach regularly in my investments class uh, at both the graduate and the undergraduate level. But then, more specifically, I think of it in terms of the standard deviation in the Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model. And so either way, volatility measures, you know, some type of pattern that goes like this. There's a little volatility like this, and there's lots of volatility like that. So let's go ahead and look at the learning objectives of this chapter. So notice we're going to have lots of defines and explain and describe. So define and distinguish, volatility, variance rate, implied volatility, power of law, weighting schemes, a couple of models. There's a calculate volatility, mean reversion, volatility forecasting, and then, and then something on term structure. So this is a fairly descriptive chapter. And so let's get right to it. What is volatility? Volatility is a variable denoted as, and there's the lowercase sigma, standard deviation of the return per unit of time. Now in risk management, um, unit of time can be almost anything, but typically one day. And remember that we're going to assume continuous compounding. And so let me just remind you quickly about continuous compounding. Let's suppose that uh, yesterday you bought a share of stock for 100 and today it sold for 110. And clearly you could just do uh, an F over P minus 1. 110 divided by 100 minus 1 gives you a 10% 10, 10 return. But to do that continuously, you need the uh, LN function on your calculator. So in, in that case, if you put the 110 in the numerator and the 100 in the denominator, you get 1.1, right? And take the natural log of it, you get a continuously compounded rate of return of about 9.5%. And so that holding period return and the continuously compounded rate of return uh, are probably going to be pretty different. And so let's just make certain that we're assuming continuous compounding throughout. Of course, what we can do then is we can use those daily continuously compounded rates of return over time to compute the standard deviation of those returns during that time period. And regularly, what we would like to do is convert that into an annual into an annual measure. And we do that by multiplying through the square root of time. Remember that standard deviation moves through time at the square root. Uh, let's take a look at a simple example of volatility. You know, this is kind of like a value at risk. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like using a normal distribution. But suppose we have an asset that priced at $100 and daily volatility is 5%. So if you multiply 5% by 100, you get $5. And so think of it, you know, you can go up by 5 to 105 or down by 5 to 95. Uh, that's the one standard deviation move in the asset price over one day. Uh, the square of volatility is known as the variance rate and then the implied volatility. And this is really a cool concept, especially as I look at it from the Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model. Those of you who remember this model, what we do is we take five important variables and one of them is the standard deviation and we use those as inputs to compute the call price but we can just look online and get the call price. So what we do is we use the call price on the left-hand side of the equal sign, and then we solve for that standard deviation on the right-hand side, and that's called the implied volatility, and it is really the market's forecast of the likely movement. Um, unlike historical volatility, implied volatility is forward-looking, and that's really an important distinction. Now, lots of times in finance and in risk management, we like to assume that stock returns or credit default swap returns or changes in credit ratings follow a normal distribution. But not, not, all, not all variables follow a normal distribution. So we need this power of law, which states that a relative change in one quantity 
results in a proportional relative change in another quantity. And so think of it like this. Uh, you know, one variable changes by this much and it causes a proportional change in this much. And here are some, here are two quick examples in my circle points. If the length of a square is doubled, the area will quadruple. The length of a side of a cube is doubled, the volume grows by a factor of eight. So there's a formula there right in the middle of the page in the uh, light blue box that the probability that some value is going to be greater than uh, uh, some other variable like x, which could be a financial variable, follows that uh, power law where v and x are the variables of interest, a is the law's exponent, and k is a constant. Let's take a look at an example here. And the power of law can has lots of good applications in, in finance. You know, income distribution is clearly not uh, a normal distribution. And then uh, retirement values or values at the date of death for an estate clearly don't follow a normal distribution. And that's, of course, because of the beauty and the magic and the power of, uh, of compounding. You know, I, 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 I've told my daughter, who's now 24, 25, several years out of college, that it's a lot easier to retire with multiple millions of dollars if she starts saving today versus when she starts, uh, if she were to wait until she were, you know, 40 or 50 or whatever year. So power of law. Uh, let's suppose that we know from experience that alpha equals three for a particular financial variable. And we observe that the probability that V is greater than 10 is just 4%. Determine the, the probability that V is greater than 20. Well, it's got to be less, right? So let's go ahead and use our power of law formula. What we'll do, first of all, is solve for K. So we have 0.04 is equal to K times 10 to the minus 3. So 10 to the minus 3, what is that? 10 times 10 is 100, times 10 is 1,000. Hit the reciprocal button, and then multiply that by 0.04, you get, uh, you get 40, right? So then we can substitute 40 in there as our k. Uh, x is 20 to the minus 3, that gives us 0.5%. And look at the uh, final arrow point there. Power law provides an alternative to assuming normal distributions. That's really, that's really why we use this. Now, a lot of times, including in the last several chapters, um, what we've done is we've looked at history, like past performance or past white noise to try to predict a time series. Well, in this chapter, we're not really worried too much about those kinds of things. We're worried about, we're worried about volatility. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is we're gonna use uh, recent estimates, recent observations of volatility to try to predict what that volatility should be today. And so a weighting scheme simply means that we're going to uh, assign more weight to recent data. I mean, clearly, if we're trying to price an option using the Black-Scholes option pricing model, the volatility that was seen yesterday is probably more important than the volatility seen last week or, or last month. So we more heavily weight the recent data. Now, what we can do is place geometrically declining weights on past observations. This is the exponentially weighted moving average. And so look at the formula there, that equation in the blue box. We're looking at today's volatility is going to be a function of the most recent squared volatility and the most recent squared return. And those things are going to be weighted by lambda and those things, uh, lambda is gonna be between zero and one, depending on whether or not we put more emphasis on the squared volatility or the squared return. Here's a quick example, daily volatility 2%, closing price yesterday 50, closing price today another 50 cents on top of that. Um, we can use that DK factor of 0.94. What is the updated estimate of volatility? First thing we do is calculate the continuously compounded rate of return, which turns out to be just about 1%. And then that updated volatility, there, let me just go back here just really quickly. There's, there's our lambda. 
and there's the 1 minus lambda 0.94 and 0.06. And there's our 2% daily volatility. We square that. There's our about 1% uh, return and we square that and we get updated volatility of 1.95%. Now continuing in this discussion on how do we compute volatility or estimate volatility, we're going to use this generalized autoregressive continued conditional heteroscedastic model. And so this is what GART stands for. Notice that the most important word for us in there, at least initially, is going to be autoregressive. So we've done these models in previous chapters. Um, what this model is going to do is not only incorporate the most recent estimates of variance and returns, but it's also going to include a long run, long run average level of variance. All right, so look at this Garch model, a hey, one, one model. There's on the left-hand side of the equal sign is today's squared volatility. And look on the far right there, there's the, there's the most recent volatility estimate. There's the most recent squared return. And then we're going to have the long run average level of squared volatility in there. That's the weighted long run variance. Now, a couple of things that are important. Uh, one of the most important things is this concept of persistence. So we must make sure that alpha and beta are less than one. This is the property of persistence so that we can have positive weights. Um, so that gamma then is going to be equal to one minus alpha minus beta. And then there's the formula for the volatility there. Let's take a quick example. Uh, we're trying to estimate daily variance using the Garch model and daily returns. And so we're given a 0 0.005 for that long run variability. Alpha is 0.05, beta is 0.94. We can estimate that long run annualized, annualized volatility. That's important. So let's do the volatility there. We use that formula. We get 0.5. Take the square root that gets us to 0.71. And then since we're doing this on a daily basis, we need to multiply it by the square root of the number of trading days during the course of the year. And that's going to be 252. You know, when I was in graduate school, we always just rounded to 250. But these readings uh, seem to like 252. Now, in statistics, there's this concept called uh, mean reversion. And volatility exhibits mean reversion, which means that if an asset uh, is experience, experiencing substantially higher volatility during a short time period, that means that it's more than likely to revert back to a lower level. So mean reversion implies that volatility will eventually, and that's really the key eventually, does that mean like tomorrow, next week, or next decade, eventually return back to the long run mean or average level. Now here's the next question then, and this is pretty much the final important question. How, how do these Garch models perform well? And, and the reality of life is that they perform very well. I mean, investment banks use this all the time to estimate volatility of, of stock returns and bond returns and credit default swaps, uh, as well as lots of other things. And the reason that these work is because these models do a good job when the returns exhibit some type of autocorrelation. That's the heteroscedasticity part of this model. Remember, back in the old time days when we did simple linear regression, we assumed homoscedasticity, and that must have meant something in terms of uh, being able to make a forecast based on that regression model. But what we learn in time series, and now we're doing a time series of volatility is that the error terms are probably correlated, at least in some fashion. And so what the heteroscedasticity part of this model does is it allows for an estimate of all of those variance and covariance terms. And that takes us through volatility. Next up, we'll talk more, more about correlations.